Hello friends and welcome back to the channel. Now, uh, I frequently keep on talking that previous year questions are the gold standard. They are the questions that guide you to the high yield topics in every subject, right? It's true. But now the point is, how do you study the previous year questions? Now, in this series of videos, I'll discuss uh, not just cardiology questions, but you know, all uh, from different subjects. But I'll try to focus on important things that you need to, you know, take away from these questions, right? So let me start with one of the questions. It's a cardiology based question, but I'll cover different parts of medicine as well in the subsequent video. So do stay tuned to the channel and do subscribe and do uh, like this video to support the channel. Now, uh, this is about a 55 year, and this is a previous year question that has been asked in an INICT exam, right? A 55 year old male patient presents with palpitations for two hours and dizziness. His vitals are, his systolic pressure is 70 millimeter mercury. His pulse is feeble and they didn't show you the ECG uh, in this question. ECG, sh they mentioned that shows narrow complex tachycardia. Now question is, what is correct about the management of this case? Do you use IV adenosine? Do you use IV verapamil, IV fluids or cardioversion? Now, uh, the point is that, you know, in INICT type exam, sometimes, you know, more than one option seem correct. For example, you might argue it's not it's not wrong to use IV adenosine. You might argue that, yes, someone who is hypotensive, you might want to give IV fluids. You know, someone may argue this patient is hemodynamically unstable and, and needs cardioversion. The INICT wants you to pick the, the most appropriate answer. And I believe uh, the answer of this question, so he is sort of unstable. You know, his systolic pressure is low. It is 70 millimeter mercury. His pulse is feeble. So he has hypotension. He has tachycardia. And most probably uh, the answer of this question is cardioversion. Now, this is what you need to know. Okay. Someone who presents with a regular supraventricular tachycardia will look at the ECGs in subsequent slides. Okay, let me just sort of try to enlarge in it if I can. No. Okay. So someone who presents with a regular supraventricular tachycardia, you attempt IV adenosine or vagal maneuvers. If patient is hemodynamically unstable, you go for synchronized cardioversion. If patient is hemodynamically stable, which means he doesn't have signs of hypoperfusion, his blood pressure is okay, his sensorium is okay, he's not collapsing, then you try these different drugs besides IV adenosine, things like diltiazem, things like verapamil or beta blockers. And if these drugs are not effective, you have attempted with these drugs, they are not effective, you go for synchronized cardioversion. The point I want to make is that if they, if they ask you, what is the drug of choice for supraventricular tachycardia, it is IV adenosine. But you have to look in the stem of the question if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. And if that's the case, then your answer becomes synchronized cardioversion. So as I've highlighted here, these are the pointers which, 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 which suggest that this patient could have hemodynamic instability. He has dizziness. His systolic pressure is low. His peripheral pulse is feeble. So the correct answer of this question is cardioversion. So this is the most common ECG that you might see in an emergency room in such a patient, someone who presents with palpitations, has regular supraventricular tachycardia. This is the, the commonest form of ECG that you will get, the AVNRT. So what do you what do you see here? You see this, first of all, it has tachycardia. So heart rate is more than 100, okay? Second, it is regular. And third, it is very difficult to look for P waves. It's very difficult to identify P waves. In fact, you cannot identify P waves here because the QRS, because the QRS and P waves occur at the same time. The atrial activation and ventricular activation occurs at the same time. So P waves are lost inside these QRS complexes. So please remember this, that whenever you have a regular narrow complex tachycardia with P wave, with, with, you can't able to localize the P waves, it's most likely AVNRT, okay? Now, what about this ECG? Now, I'm, I'm going this through this ECG because it's relevant because some, some of your patients who are presenting to emergency room may have this ECG. It's again tachycardia. It's again a narrow complex tachycardia, but notice it's irregular. It's irregular. Now, in such a case where you have irregularly irregular 
narrow complex tachycardia, your diagnosis is not SPT, your diagnosis is atrial fibrillation. Sometimes this patient, 55-year-old male, the same, the, the stem of the question will remain the same, but they will say it's not a narrow complex tachycardia, it's a wide complex tachycardia. Now, this is a classic example of tachycardia that is regular, but that is wide complex. And your number one differential for the CCG has to be ventricular tachycardia. Now, no matter what, if they give you this CCG, or if they give you the atrial fibrillation ECG, or if they give you AVNRT ECG. The point I want to make is that if the question provides you this, that the patient is hemodynamically unstable, your answer is always DC cardioversion. Okay, so this is how you need to study. The question was about a narrow complex tachycardia. The question was about a patient who was hemodynamically unstable. So through this question, you got to revise so many things. You got to revise the algorithm for management of supraventricular tachycardia. You got to know about two different types of patients. The one who is hemodynamically stable, where IV adenosine, IV beta blockers are going to work. And about patients who are hemodynamically unstable, where you want to cardioverge. You also came to know about different forms of narrow complex tachycardias like AVNRT or like atrial fibrillation. Okay. And then you also just, um, you know, revised one of its neighbors, which is a wide complex tachycardia, which is ventricular tachycardia. So you revised three different ECGs, AVNRT, atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia by just reading one INICT type question. That is how you need to understand INICT questions. It's not just about this particular question. It's about the topics that are related to this question, right? So you need to be, you know, prepared to face ECGs which have tachycardia and you need to know the appropriate management, okay? Now let's look at another similar question from INICT only. It, this was asked uh, in 2020. This is about a 30 year old female postpartum period. She develops acute kidney injury. These are her labs, sodium of 135, potassium 6.5, chloride 105. Now they ask you, what is the next step in management? Okay, is it IV fluids? Is it dextrose and insulin? Is it calcitonin? Is it potassium chloride given in IV fluids? Now, um, it seems a straightforward question because this, uh, this patient has 6.5 of potassium and you're not going to give her KCL, obviously. You know that the management of hyperkalemia involves dextrose and insulin. Right. So that is what you had to understand. This patient is acute kidney injury that led to hyperkalemia. And this is what comes in the algorithm of hyperkalemia. There's another pearl here. INICT loves to ask questions about medical emergencies. So you better read medical emergencies in detail. You better read the standard book for these medical emergencies. You know calcium gluconate is the drug of choice to stabilize the cardiac membrane when somebody has symptomatic hyperkalemia. You know insulin dextrose, you know sodium bicarbonate causes shift of potassium into the cells from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid. You know this. You know diuretics cause excretion of sodium, potassium from the body. You know that if someone has hyperkalemia which is not managed with, with, with medications, has acute kidney injury, is anuric, well, he requires hemodialysis. You know these potassium binders help reduce absorption of potassium from the GI tract. So all this you need to keep in mind. Now, if someone is interested in knowing the doses, these are, these are um, you know, copy paste from Harrison's textbook. You can uh, clearly see the dose of calcium gluconate is 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate that's given slow IV under cardiac monitoring. Well, this is not important with respect to INICT, but I put it here because you should know this. You're working as an intern. You may later on be a surgery resident or medicine resident, whatever resident you are, you should know management of hyperkalemia, right? Because this can be life-saving for some patient. And similarly, the dosing of insulin dextrose, this is what we classically do. 10 units of regular insulin is given, followed immediately by 50 ml of 50% dextrose. Now, once you start working in wards, in medicine ward or pediatrics ward, you'll be managing hyperkalemia every right and left. But it may or may not be asked in INICT, the dosings, but you need to know calcium gluconate is used in management of hyperkalemia, insulin dextrose is used, and that's what they asked. This is a genuine question, and please be prepared for most of the medical emergencies as INICT questions, right?
So these are the ECG manifestations, if you want to remember, for hyperkalemia, right? These tall peak T waves and then widening of all of these intervals, widening of PR interval, widening of QRS duration, or just stretching out of the entire ECG. And later on, as the potassium increases further, you have appearance two wide complexes, so as uh, which are known as sinusoid complexes, right? You should know this ECG if you are a doctor, if you're an MBBS graduate, you should know that such an ECG with very tall and peaked and tented T waves, the thing that should come to your mind is hyperkalemia. These are tall, they're symmetrical, they're peak, tall, tented T waves. You should think of hyperkalemia. And when the potassium is even higher, say for example, this might be the ECG at a potassium 6.5, the potassium is close to 7, then your ECG, you know, you just stretch out the ECG, it becomes so bizarre, this wide QRS, so that is hyperkalemia, right? And at the same point, you should know the adjacent topics of this particular NICT question. They asked about hyperkalemia, you should know about hypokalemia as well, okay? If hyperkalemia causes peak T waves, hypokalemia causes T wave depression, and prominence and, and, and appearance of U waves, okay? So this is what this video was about. I want you to understand that I and I C T questions are clinically important topics. Please read the question. Please understand that topic well. You know, you may have to read the neighboring question as well from the textbook. If the question asked about an uh, INICT was regarding SVT, you might have to read atrial fibrillation as well. You might have to read ventricular tachycardia. You have to read tachyarrhythmias presenting to the emergency. For that matter, all medical emergencies are asked in INICT. They will ask you about status epilepticus, right? They will ask you about snake bite. They will ask you about acute coronary syndrome. They will ask you about stroke, different things. For example, contraindications, absolute contraindications or relative contraindications, thrombolysis. So that is the message I want you to give. Once you see these questions appearing in INICT, you should know that we need to read the medical emergencies in detail. And when you are in third year MBBS or in fourth year MBBS, please read these questions from standard books, Harrison, okay? And then go to your clinical postings and see how these passion, patients are actually managed in the emergency department, okay? So good luck for your preparation and good luck for your career. Thank you.